ओम वसुदेव सुत देव कंसचाणूरमदनम देवकी परमानंदम कृष्ण वंदे जगद्गु So a couple of classes ago we have done the Brahmarpanam uh, verse in the fourth chapter. So today I just wanted to share a little personal experience I had, a little uh, epiphany. Uh, in the morning I was taking a walk in the Central Park. Very nice, uh, cool and bright day. I was sitting by the lake wa- watching the ducks swimming around in circles. Um, very nice, very pleasant. And I was thinking, so all the pleasant things one could want in life i have all of it uh, so um, i was just thinking about all the all of you people who have high pressure corporate jobs and uh, i have uh, hardly anything to do at all it's just a little past time for me answer a few emails and give a few talks which i enjoy anyway and uh, uh, i have good food provided by all the devotees i am taken care of uh, i have an a place to live in the upper west side in manhattan and uh, here i'm getting to take a walk in the morning in in the central park the the weather is nice my health is fine people are nice to me people are respectful um, i have any amount of books and computer and all uh, whatever i want everything is there um, and there is nothing in the really in my mind which i could desire any more so all the things which are pleasant likable and nice in life line up all of them then i asked a question to my mind so is are you happy now is this enough for happiness honestly and immediately the answer came no is there anything more you want no nothing more what else could one want reasonably so the great um, insight is that all the nice things we want in the setup of our lives even if all of them were set given to us if we could have all of them um satisfied it still would not be fulfilling there would still be this what the existentialists call an existential angst left there's a kind of lack of fulfillment of the heart and then i thought about i was thinking about the brahmarpanam here is this one unlimited radiance in which appears this entire universe i am that all of these beings the human beings and the birds and the ducks and they're all one with me we are all one existence this radiance which is my true nature is immortal it cannot be destroyed by disease or death it wants nothing in fact the entire universe is a sort of overflowing of its uh, of its bounty if you think like that and uh, if you notice that then the heart feels so full you feel so happy uh, and that happiness it has a security which cannot be shaken by anything see what happens is what i was thinking is this all the setup of my life is very fine what a person might want and yet it is not fulfilling number 1 number 2 this pleasant setup of our lives is very vulnerable people are nice to me tomorrow they might not be there might be one person who is difficult and not nice to me my health is good tomorrow i might get covid and i might be rushed to the hospital in one of those ambulances which are rushing back and forth all the time um health might fail and will fail one day in fact and one second all of these things are vulnerable yet the joy of our real nature the brahmarpanam brahmahavi that is not vulnerable that is guaranteed forever once you recognize that it's continuously available to you all the time and it is completely fulfilling sri ramakrishna's example of ones and zeros immediately came to mind all of these things which are which constitute the most desired for setup of our lives money and uh, the choices of possessions and uh, friends and the uh, family and uh, success name and fame and glory whatever all of those once even if you can get them all 
there would still be a collection of zeros. Still somewhere it is not fulfilling. And yet there is a one. If you just get the one, that's enough. The Bhagavad Gita says, Yang labdhva na chaparam labham manyate tato dekam. Having attained which, one does not consider there is anything higher to be attained than that. One has reached the, the zenith. Um, Yasmin stito dukkhena guruna apina vichalyate. Being established in which even the heaviest of sh- sorrows cannot shake you. So this setup, the most pleasant setup you can think of, it will go away. This was the great insight of the Buddha. And the Buddha's insight was samsara is in continuous change. Anityam, anityam, sarvam anityam, impermanent, impermanent, indeed all is impermanent. Not only impermanent, kshanikam, shanikam, sarvam shanikam, momentary, momentary, indeed all is momentary. Not only impermanent and momentary, but empty. Shunyam, shunyam, sarvam shunyam, void, void, verily everything is the void. Impermanent, transitory and void. That is the nature of this entire setup. And if we can work to establish the kind of setup you desire, people, possessions, health, job, career, all of it as per your dream, whatever you can wish for. The moment you set it up, what does the Buddha say? Subject to change. So the moment you set up, one thing is guaranteed, it will change. So the perfect setup, by definition, will become imperfect the next moment or the next day, or the next week, or the next month. Whereas, this realization of this underlying reality from which the entire universe appears, that is perfect and unchangeable, beyond any change at all. That's, that is your nature forever. So this was the epiphany. Right? And it doesn't have to be in, in the knowledge format. It could be in the devotion format also. The entire universe is the Lord's universe. God exists. I am the child of God. Or I am the servant of the Lord. And you will find that is also deeply fulfilling. Immediately fulfilling. When the setup around you is good according to your wishes. You are centered in God. Or you have the realization Aham Brahmasmi centered in that. Then the pleasant setup around you you can enjoy. If the setup around you becomes unpleasant. Which it will because of the flow of karma. One day it becomes unpleasant. Centered in God. In, in Brahman, in the realization of the self, you will, be, you will have the peace and the strength to face it with equanimity. So this is the beauty of spiritual life. This is the importance. The, the epiphany I thought I should share uh, with all of us. Alright. So that was the 24th verse. And then we remember, Sri Krishna has been telling us about spiritual practices. Uh, he has talked about a series of spiritual practices. In fact, from the 25th verse onwards, Sri Krishna talks about 12 spiritual practices. 12 spiritual practices. And he has a unique way of talking about these practices. What is the way? Yajna. Um, the Vedic fire sacrifice. Why the Vedic fire sacrifice? Because that was the most um, uh, common form, well-known form of religion in those days. Arjuna was most familiar with that as religion. And Sri Krishna, is t- today we, if, you, if he was here today, he would have said puja. He would have said the, the, used the word puja because that's the one with which Hindus are most. Uh, why only Hindus? Buddhists have seen Tibetan Buddhists and all, they all do puja. So the ritualistic worship with which we are most familiar. Sri Krishna says, yes, that's the spiritual practice, but that's just one. The highest form of spiritual practice, the highest form of yajna is what we just talked about. Brahma Arpanam Brahmahavi to realize Brahman everywhere. The Brahman alone exists. But the other forms of spiritual practice, they are also, they can be described as yajnas. Not just ritualism. Twelve forms he talks about. One of course is the highest form. Brahma Arpanam Brahmahavi. He gives the whole um, Brahma Jnana, realization of Brahman, the format of a yajna. The offering is Brahman, the ladle with which you offer is Brahman, the, one, the fire into which you are offering is Brahman, um, the one who is offering is Brahman. And if you see actions, Brahman in all actions in this way, you realize Brahman, you become a Jivan Mukta. So you see enlightenment as a Yajna, that's the highest. But there are 11 other types of practices which he talks about. Um, 
we have seen some of them he talks about um, uh, the deva yagya that means the the vedic ritualistic sacrifice itself the original form of the yagya or today he might say the, the puja puja which you do to uh, vishnu or shiva or devi the puja that itself is a spiritual ritualistic worship is a spiritual practice is a yagya to be done then another this is the second type the third type he mentioned i think in verse 26 yes very interesting um he says one second he says all our sensory activities hearing smelling tasting touching um seeing imagine that all of them are being poured into the fire which is within what is the fire consciousness is the fire the devata sitting within ourselves awareness that is the fire into which all sensory inputs are being poured so when i see something i imagine it i visualize it is a practice i visualize it like pouring Uh, oblations into the vedic fire sacrifice i am pouring all the forms through my eyes into consciousness when i hear sounds i am pouring all the sounds into consciousness so that's the that's the second kind of third kind of uh, yagya which he is talking about imagine all sensory all sensations as a yagya being poured it poured into the fire of consciousness the third or uh, fourth kind of practice which he talked about again 26th verse um is sanyama agnishu control when i control the activities you will not see this these are the things you will not taste these are the things you will not hear control regulate my sensory activities self regulation the ability to regulate my consumption of sense objects that regulation is the fire into which i am pouring my sensory activities that control is the fire sense control is the fire and all my sensory inputs are the activities and are the offerings that i am pouring into that i mean uh, just by the way you know the term emotional intelligence which is popularized by daniel goleman uh, he said emotional eq is is a better predictor of success in life than iq more important than sheer intelligence is emotional intelligence what are the components of emotional intelligence one of the components of emotional intelligence is a self regulation the ability to regulate one's feelings perceptions to be in control of oneself that's a sign of intelligence this is emotional intelligence sanyam agnishu then the fifth one fifth practice also we see is that um, not just control of the senses behind the senses is the mind control of the mind we saw that that is the fire control of the difference between control of senses and mind control of senses i will not see this i will not hear this i will i will regulate my sensory activity control of the mind is reducing the desire itself calming the mind itself which is behind the senses the desire itself for hearing smelling tasting touching that has to be regulated that's another kind of sacrifice more subtle you can imagine it as a yagya then in 28 verse which we did last time i think we started it last time um five more practices have been mentioned by sri krishna dravya yagya that is the sixth kind of uh, practice dravya yagya means the sacrifice of a material sacrifice in the sense of giving so donating so, uh, for example in this country in the united states it it's a very well known it, it's a very common and wonderful practice people are generous so instead of wasting things you give it to the, those who are less fortunate give it to those who need it it could be warm clothes it could be um toys for children whatever it is materials you give to others um that is a, a, a spiritual practice not just material it could be money not just materials and money it could be your time you go and work in a soup kitchen for example or you go and do free service where you do you do not want anything back that's also giving then the seventh one is tapo yagya the vows austerity is a practice so one takes vows we we talked about it last time i think vow of silence um that i will not speak so much or i will reduce my speech 
and for this day or half a day or few days i will not speak that's a particular vow or on shivaratri we do that in the monastery we do not sleep so i'm sleeping every night but on this night i will not why do we do that what we are normally accustomed to things we are normally accustomed to doing things we are normally accustomed to eating for example uh, those we consciously deliberately give up for a specific time or a specific occasion why so that deliberately i can use this as a way of getting control of my body mind no harm if i don't eat half a day in fact people say it is good if you fast for half a day it's good for the system so i use this as an opportunity to bring my body mind deliberately under control not by force consciously i have decided i will not eat in this or i will not eat these items of food pilgrimages people undertake pilgrimages so the pilgrimages deliberately some hardships are built into the pilgrimages you have to walk up the hill like this you have to eat this kind of very simple maybe vegetarian food or maybe one meal a day you have to get up early and take a bath and so many rules are there for pilgrimages why there are some kind of tapasya uh, spiritual uh, uh, austerity tapo yagya those are also you can consider them as a yagya uh, yoga yagya patanjali yoga meditation can be considered as a yagya as a spiritual practice he calls calls it a yagya what is patanjali yoga yama niyama the moral prerequisites asana sitting still not running around so much sit still then pranayama control of the breath and then pratyahara control of the senses and then uh, dharana focus of the mind then meditation dhyana and then ultimately samadhi absorption this itself is a powerful spiritual practice very powerful very systematic very powerful spiritual practice patanjali yoga is mentioned here meditation the practice of meditation is a, is another yagya number 8 number 9 swadhyaya recitation of mantras originally it meant only vedic chanting with properly trained it could be recitation of mantras and stotras or even singing of songs you might say um, reading of the texts uh, regularly gyana yagya number 10 So what is the difference between this Jnana Yagya and the first one, which was Brahma Arpana and Brahma Habi? Here the Jnana Yagya means regular study of the scriptures. Not just reciting them, not just chanting them. Regular study like we are doing now. This is Jnana Yagya. How is this different from Brahma Arpana? If you are studying Vedanta, you are studying Gita, Upanishads, um, uh, Aparoksha, Nubhuti, Drik, Drishya, Viveka, Vedanta, Sara. So this study is Shravana, Manana, Pradhana. Primarily Shravana and Manana. we study it systematically we think about it we question we try to grasp it this is a spiritual practice a very good form of spiritual practice how is this different from brahma arpana brahma havi that is where you have completed shravana and manana one has already had the breakthrough and one stabilizes oneself one steadies oneself that is called jnana nishtha or brahma nishtha and the brahma arpana brahma havi is, is a final stage of advaita vedanta where one is established in that after that there is only jivan mukti one is free while living so, uh, this one is preparatory what we are doing right now is gyana yagya of this 10th type 10th um, yagya then 11th one he will say pranayama itself he gives a lot of a uh, whole one verse he has given to pranayama the control of the breath that is also a yagya and the 12th one will be in 30th verse which is control of food food intake um let me read those let us just read those verses and then we will see number 29 apane juhati pranam prane panam tatha pare prana pana gati ruddha pranayama parayana still others devoted to the control of the vital force pranayama offer as a sacrifice the outgoing breath prana in the incoming apana uh, as also the incoming breath in the outgoing and after restraining the activity of the incoming and outgoing breath okay so what is this pranayama and why is it important it's a part of yoga pranayama prana literally means life not just breath prana means life 
and it is part of the subtle body, Sukshma Sharira. Physical body, Annamaya Kosha, this one, physical body. Subtler than this, inward to this, is the vital body, Pranamaya Kosha. Subtler than this, inward to this, is the mental body, Manomaya Kosha. Subtler than that, inward to that, is Vijnanamaya, the intellectual body. And then finally, the, the causal body, Karana Sharira, which is Anandamaya Kosha. And transcending all of this, the witness of all of this is, of course, you, the Atman. But now, the important thing is, physical body is here. Once you calm down the physical body, you sit down for meditation. Don't jump directly to control of the mind. Everybody complains, we cannot control the mind. The mind is fickle. Even Arjuna complained to Krishna in the 6th chapter. After a lot of nice instructions in meditation, Arjuna says it's no good. The yoga stoya prokta, he says this yoga which you have ta taught, O Madhusudana, it is not useful. Why not? Because it's very difficult to control the mind. Now, one of the techniques of controlling the mind is pranayama. See, Krishna gives importance to pranayama here. Why is it important? Between the mind and the body, between Annamaya Kosha and Pranamaya Kosha, uh, between Annamaya Kosha and Manomaya Kosha, between mind and the body, is the prana, is the movement of the breaths. Uh, five breaths are mentioned in, uh, in our Indian physiology. Prana, Apana, Vyana, Udana, Samana. And these are different five functions. They are physiological functions. Circulation and digestion and all of this. Now, to control the mind is difficult. You need something which is connected to the mind and easier to control. So the breath is connected to the mind. When the mind is restless, the breath is also short and uneven. When the mind is dull and sleepy, the breath is heavy. Dull, sleepy, sick, breath is heavy. When the mind is excited, breath is fast. Angry, excited. When the mind is calm, the breath is also even and calm. Um, you will find the breath will flow through both nostrils. And there will be, you, you will not even find, there will be no sound. There will be uh, very, it will be very light, but also deep. It will go deep and be light and effortlessly so. So, if we want, the, the reverse is true. If I want an excited mind to calm down, then if I can control the breath and make it even and rhythmic, the excited mind will calm down. The sleepy mind will become alert. And so it is useful for meditation. That's why it is recommended before meditation one should do pranayama. It's a long and it's a big, big subject. The yogis, the Hatha yogis have developed it to a great degree. I have very little knowledge of it. But we all learn a little bit of it because of meditation and we do that also before our ritualistic puja, before the actual puja starts. So a little bit of pranayama is done. The pranayama consists, uh, as Krishna said, consists of three, three phases. Three phases. Breathing in, puraka. Holding the breath, kumbhaka. And letting the breath out, rechaka. And it is measured. It is brought under. If you bring these under control, after a few cycles of pranayama, the mind also calms down. Now, how do you do that? So there is a ratio. And the ratio is, 4 is to 16 is to 8. 4 is to 16 is to 8. 4 counts breathing in, 16 counts holding, 8 counts exhaling. Again 4 counts breathing in, 16 counts holding and 8 counts exhaling to the 2 nostrils. So this is a way of closing the nostrils. So this thumb close the right nostril and you breathe in through the left and you count OM four times. You don't have to keep the hand here. I am just demonstrating for you. Hand should be, okay, this hand should be kept on your lap and you should count four times OM. OM, 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 OM. Not loudly, mentally and you are uh, breathing in at the same time. So four counts OM, a full breath you take in without any, too much exertion, without too much exertion but a full breath. Having done that, then you use these two fingers, two middle fingers, 
to close the left nostril. Now both nostrils are closed and you will count 8 counts, six, uh, sorry 16 counts of Om. Om, 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 16 counts. And then let out the breath for 8 counts through the right nostril. Om, 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 Om. That is 8 counts on the right nostril. And then you breathe in for 4 counts again from the right nostril. Doing the Om count for 4. Hold for 16. And release for 8. This is one pranayama. It, it's much easier than it, uh, than it sounds. When you're telling it, it sounds difficult. But actually it's much easier. Uh, it is just, remember the ratio, 4 is to 16 is to 8. 4, 16, 8. So basically, 1 is to 4 is to 2. That is the ratio. If you want to increase, you have to increase in that, that ratio. Um, so... Um, if you if you hold if you breathe in for eight counts, then you have to hold it for thirty two counts and release for sixteen counts like that. And don't and don't do that. Also, the <laughs> other thing which is has to be said is uh, this should not be done without the guidance of a good hatha yoga teacher. Otherwise, there is always the possibility of harm rather than good. Um, what kind of pranayama is good and and harmless? That is. Your rhythmic deep breathing. Breathe in till you have filled your lungs. And then make one more effort. Little more breath. And then you will see you will be able to fill a little more. And then let it go without holding it. Breathe out. And after you have breathed out, make a little more effort to breathe out a little more also. You will find that there is some air left. And then again breathe in. Few times. You can do it three times, five times. The pranayama I showed, you can do it once, twice, thrice, uh, uh, four, five times. Mind will become calm. It has a direct effect on the mind. So that is a practice. Again, don't jump into doing it. Aha, here is something much better than all the Atman, Brahman stuff. No. Uh, the holding the breath can have a, a bad effect if it's not practiced properly. It should be connected to a um, sattvic diet should be connected to a strict routine then only it has a proper effect otherwise it can be damaging to the body mind okay so pranayama is one type of yajna then next number 30 I think we have got some activity let me just look at the activity before I go to number 30 by the way Twelve practices Krishna has mentioned here, calling them all yajna. One must remember, they are yajna. Why are they called yajna? Why is eating a yajna? Why is hearing, smelling, tasting, touching? A, it's a yajna. How can it become a yajna? How can it become a spiritual practice? Only when you offer it to God. Ordinarily when I am eating, drinking, that is not yajna. So, one become, makes a practice. I have seen monks, and they make a, for example, common practice among the monks is, you will see when they are going to drink something, eat something, they mentally, you will see a little gesture like this. What are they doing? They are offering it to God and taking it as prasad. So everything is offered to God, not just the food. What we eat uh, is not, on, not only that, what you see, what you hear, what you smell, what you taste, what you touch. All the activities of the sense of the, of the motor organs. Um, uh, of course, the ritualistic worship is offered to God, but so is pranayama offered to God. When we, I am giving um, dravya yajna in donation, in charity, not as I am here is something in charity I am throwing at, at a poor person, unfortunate person, that is not yajna. I am offering to the Lord in this way. These are the objects which uh, I, I, are in my possession. This is the money, this is the resources I have. The Lord has given me an opportunity to offer Him, to worship the Lord in this way. So by money, by 
objects by my effort by my time i am worshiping god as much as i worship god by putting flowers and incense and mantras in the puja room then only it becomes dravya yagya otherwise it's just donation it's just charity swami vivekananda says let the giver kneel down and offer let the receiver stand up and receive kneel down and offer means you are offering to god not to a poor person or unfortunate person that is become that becomes the dravya yagya tapo yagya the vows which i am observing um, regular fasting why are you doing that it could be to um, i want i want to lose lose weight and have a slim and fit body that is not uh, tapo yagya that is uh, dieting it becomes tapo tapo yagya when i am offering that as a practice to god whether it is staying away on shivaratri whether it is fasting on ekadashi whatever kind of practice all of these all religions have these practices the uh, ramadan of the muslims uh, the various uh, fasts in uh, catholic, uh, catholic uh, the catholic yearly routine so these are all meant for that uh, the jewish religion has its fasts and so on so these are all meant for bringing the body mind under control and they are offered to god another important thing has to be kept in mind what is the purpose of all of this the purpose has to be kept in mind the purpose is god realization the purpose is moksha the purpose is enlightenment if the purpose is to lose weight or i'm doing pranayama to ga- gain uh, spiritual powers people do that there are yogis in india who practice these things in order to gain occult powers telepathy things like that then it is not yagya it's not a spiritual practice it's it's um, material pursuit then so it must be offered to god and it must be for the purpose all these practices are for the purpose of god realization you can use many of these practices for material benefit then it will not be yagya so this is one thing that has to be understood it's not always clearly understood it's a simple thing gita is a moksha shastra one has to understand what is the prayojanam when you start any vedanta text prayojanam means purpose of this the purpose is god realization the purpose is moksha nirvana salvation whatever you call it freedom that is the purpose of gita that is the purpose of upanishad of all these texts and so that's obvious what else could be there no no there are other things um gita for leadership or <laughs> so many things are there for you know the panchakosha i saw the panchakosha model for healthy body mind so panchakosha model for healthy body mind is it wrong it's not wrong there's so much wisdom why the only the bhagavad gita i saw this seminar for corporate executives what would jesus do so from the bible so leadership lessons from the bible for what for making profit so that is not for god realization are there is it wrong it's not wrong it's not wrong that must be clear there's so much wisdom in the holy books gita and also the other holy books and they can be used for making our life better in our day to day life for better human relationships and sri krishna will later say what is the proper diet what is proper exercise what is proper sleep all those things also he will mention these are good for health so healthy life good relationships uh, advancing my career better organizational um, atmosphere in company and those also how to achieve the bottom line you know those also can be done by these these things are there which can be used servant leadership is a big thing in the corporate world now it all comes from here so you can use it but then it will not be yagya it will not be yagya i remember once i was called many many years ago about 15 16 years ago to give a talk in a very big uh, company uh, it was uh, one of the india's largest steel producers so i had to give a talk to um their lower level management uh, and the upper management had organized this you know the hr department keeps doing this so they say bring in a monk so i gave a talk about meditation and karma yoga and all of that and people were listening they were interested there were hundreds of this uh, lower level management staff and um, then it was all spoiled by the uh, the hr top hr manager who came in and he said so we have all heard the swami now and now we'll have no problem achieving our targets i said god achieving our targets is that's not the point 
I'm sorry to disappoint the uh, corporate corporate bosses. You there's nothing wrong in achieving the targets. You should achieve the targets. That's great. But the purpose of the spiritual practices is a moksha, God realization. Offer to God, and remember the purpose. Gita is a moksha shastra. Often people get confused. I had to repeat. I made this a point. I had to repeat it again and again uh, when I was at Harvard in the discussions. People get confused. What is religion for actually? And if you listen to the discussions, religion is so. Um, what is the position of religion on LGBTQ? How it can be used for um, you know uh, social activism? Fine, you can use it. I am not saying it's not for that. But that's not the purpose. And this seemed to be something new. People agreed with it, that you are right. But people tend to forget. There's so much involvement. In the academics, the whole divinity school is meant for study of religion and spirituality. But what is the purpose of religion and spirituality? Not particularly clear. Many people are not clear about it. Here it is very clear. Yajna, it becomes a spiritual practice only if you uh, want it for God realization. Otherwise, it is something materialistic. Moksha is the ultimate purpose. Let us look at the activity in the chat. Um, Rick says, could anything cause this realization to be lost, such as senility? No. That's an important factor. People say that. So suppose I have the knowledge and then maybe I have a stroke. So will it go away again? No. This is one must be clear about. This thing... The ignorance in the mind goes away, the knowledge is there and your freedom, your moksha is not dependent on that knowledge. Let me repeat that. Your, you, are, you have moksha because your nature is Brahman already. You already have it. The knowledge does not produce moksha. Knowledge does not give you liberation. You already are liberated. The knowledge just points that out. We did not know, now we know. So could we not know again? Could that come back again? No, it will not come back. Yes, a stroke may be debilitating. I may forget some of the verses of the Gita if I get a stroke. I may not be able to give a Vedanta talk. I may not be even able to talk if the body is paralyzed. I might not remember uh, the Vedant Vedic texts or Vedantic texts or the references. No. I might not be able to write books and articles. No. But my inner light that I am Brahman, will it be lost? No. It is not lost. And I have seen example after example of this. I have seen senior monks on the verge of passing away, very seriously ill. But the knowledge of Brahman burns bright within them. Swami Abhedanandaji, he tested it. So he was wandering in the Himalayas at that time. At that, at that time he was studying under, um, under Devi Giriji, I think, in uh, in Kailashmat, in Rishikesh. So they were studying Vedanta. There is a great ve traditional Vedantic teacher. And Swami Abhedanji used to stay in a hut, beg for his food and go and attend the classes. And he felt he had attained clarity and a breakthrough. But he wanted to test it. Suppose the body collapses, even the mind gives way. Will I retain this knowledge that I am the Atman? And so he prayed for illness. And on the same day, three terrible illnesses struck him. I think blood dysentery was one, malaria was the other one, something else. Three of them. And he, he was so sick, he could not go to the class, he could not go for his daily round of begging for food, could not get out of the bed. He kept going in and out of, you know, uh, losing consciousness, going in and out. Then the, the mind became delirious. He, he could not keep track of his thoughts. And he says, later on he says, I was delighted to see throughout all of this the light of awareness burned bright. It was filled with an inner joy. They were suffering on the surface. Body weak and suffering. A mind also, I cannot control the thoughts and they are becoming weak and disoriented. Clearly I am not this bit of equipment called body-mind. And when it is weak, ill, maybe dying, he would have died, thank God, some of his other brother disciples came. Sharat Maharaj and somebody else also came. Uh, they, they nursed him and sent him uh, back to the monastery for recovery. But he writes in his uh, biography, his own experience. 
he's not he's not the only one again and again we have seen this under greatest illness at the point of death one retains i have seen monk i have seen paralyzed physically paralyzed both legs are paralyzed one arm is paralyzed and blind in two eyes full of joy unblemished how is it the, this monk i saw he was a disciple of swami and he was a disciple of swami vigyanananda ji uh, so this old monk i saw both legs paralyzed one arm paralyzed and both eyes blind completely helpless and for years and years he remained like that a person so full of vigor and joy i even just thinking about it uplifts one this taught me what it means to be bodiless transcend the body it's not like you leave the body like a puff of smoke and you observe it from a distance not like that here you are same body same experiences it does not matter even the least and all the time encouraging others inspiring others full of uh, you know only i can say spirit <laughs> it is possible i have seen it in bhutesh anand ji i have seen it in ranganath anand ji um atmastan ji all the senior monks again and again and again i've seen it one of the greatest monks i knew uh, he was relatively unknown but um 14 hours a day he had to be he had to take oxygen always face twinkling with joy eyes twinkling and face radiant with joy hey, so many times then in chapter 10 there is this among the yagyas is the japa yagya he praises that remember chapter 10 um he says i am this i am this i am this but at the end you will see i am everything so not just japa yagya he is all the yagyas but among japa yagya uh, so he praises japa yagya as the best yagya this is a very good yagya so definitely japa yagya is very good can you patrick says can you explain why the mind examining itself isn't the subject object being the same the mind examining itself isn't the subject object being the same no because when the mind examines itself if you're talking about introspection then what happens in introspection the mind thinks about its earlier thoughts the mind thinks about its earlier thoughts something we have thought about some experience we had when we introspect we think about that so one thought thinking about the other thought not the one thought thinking about itself it can't that can't happen subject object cannot be the same it's taken as a great fault in philosophy it's called the fault of self reflexivity um the karta and the karma cannot be the same thing the doer and the action cannot be the same thing i can use this fingertip to touch this fingertip but i cannot use this fingertip to touch this same fingertip impossible which bhagavad gita book is being used in this course anyone you please as long as it's it has got the original verses and a relatively neutral translation i use multiple versions the one i'm using now is this only because it's handy it's a small one it's um, bhagavad gita published by madras ramakrishna math madras and translated by swami gideshwaran ji it's just got the original verses and an english translation but there are many others also i use um, a couple of versions of shankara's commentary then verses 26 27 control senses mind as yagya could seekers practice them with the intent to develop shama dhamma in the six fold yes these are actually shama and dhamma control of the senses control of the mind are actually shama and dhamma instead of um, calling them sangyama um uh, you know yagya you can call them shama yagya and dhamma yagya rekha ji says occasionally when i'm deep in nididhyasan i find that stop breathing and end up gasping you're not doing anything wrong that can happen that can happen and it's a good thing don't try to stop breathing but if it happens automatically in deep thought in deep focus the breath stops for a while and that's all right what is the difference between pranayama and mindfulness um in mindfulness the breath is used as an anchor 
So I gave a talk about this. You will see um, on Buddhist mindfulness, this basic practice of mindfulness, a very simple practice. You just as aware of the movement of the breath. But pranayama is a deliberate control of the breath in order to calm down the mind. So there is a difference. Um, Gabriel says, is the reason for the seemingly importance of number four, a breath, multiple, multiple of four, meditation at 4 a.m., 4 p.m.? No, not necessarily. Don't make too much of uh, numerology. Hmm? Prabir Babu is saying, is offering my karma to God not enough? It's enough, yes. But all of these are karma. Look at all these yagyas, all the twelve of them. Except the Brahmarpanam, the rest is karma. And Brahmarpanam also means that seeing Brahman in all karma. That is, oh, so don't feel that. Now Krishna has given me a list of twelve different yagyas to do. I have to do so many things. Don't, not at all. Don't worry about it. Some of us are already doing these things. Many of us do puja. Many of us do meditation. Most of us do meditation. Most of us give to those, uh, to wherever, and to good causes. Just make it into yagya. Make it as an offering to God. All of us eat. You can develop a practice of just mentally offering to God. And whatever I eat is prasad. Whatever I drink is prasad. These are small practices. Oh, one more point I should make. This is important from the Advaitic pers perspective. Out of the 12 practices, 11 are supporting, 11 are fo foundational and the 12th one, the one of them is the ultimate. Which is the ultimate? Brahmar Pranam Brahmahavi. Krishna will himself say that later on. All the rest are preparatory. All the rest purify body and mind. He will say that just now. They are, they are important but they are preparatory. And the whole purpose of all of this is Brahmar Pranam Brahmahavi. Moksha is the ultimate purpose, but it seems that there is also relative purposes. Yoga is skill and action. Correct. Uh, one must go from bad karma to good karma to beyond karma. So from going from bad karma to good karma, that involves two things. One is going from adharma to dharma, from unethical action to ethical action. And then from ethical action to ethical action without desire, nishkama karma. And that is skill in action. Prabhupada would say, Swami, this is all knowledge that the world has ever received comes from the mind, the infinite library of the universe is in your mind. So what knowledge do we get by studying the scriptures? What am I missing? So the scriptures awaken this knowledge in our mind. Ultimately, all textbooks, you know, what, what can they do? They, dev they bring out the knowledge in our mind. They are only suggestions. With, without them, we cannot because these are the instruments which help us to um, awaken that knowledge. You know, in the philosophy of education, educational psychology. So, how do we learn? And there are so many theories. So, the old theory was what is called the tabula rasa, that the mind, the infant, the child's mind is blank and then the teacher pours knowledge into it. That's the old idea. That's not true. It's not that the child's mind is blank and the teacher has to fill it up with knowledge. That's the way our schools and colleges were organized. And it never works. Because every child reacts differently to the same teaching. So a new um, approach is called constructivism. Constructivism is not from construction. It's from construing. Uh, construing means when we get an impulse, something from the world, our mind takes that impulse from the world, a text, a teaching or something, and then starts working on it and makes something out of it. With understanding, not understanding, misunderstanding, something. But our mind is, it is construed in the mind. Knowledge also, if it comes, it does not come from outside. It is the mind rearranging itself. You give a blow to the mind in the form of a book, a diagram, a teaching, an aphorism, something, then the mind rearranges itself. That rearranging is called um, construing. And that's how knowledge comes. Poonamji says, are all the spiritual practices mentioned here essential for the seekers? Are these practices for purification? Oh, we just answered this. Are these practices for purification of mind? Yes. Can we get liberation by the spiritual practices? No. Only by um, Brahmar Param Brahmahavi. That one. The highest Jnana Yagya. Gloria says, I recently met Swami Sridharanj from Sydney. Where did you meet him, Gloria? Recently? But, uh, are you in Sydney? I met, I met him in Adelaide. 
I'm in Adelaide. You're in Adelaide. So, okay, right, yes. right. They've just started a. They've just bought a new building here. They acquired a, an Anglican church. Yes. And this Tommy came from Sydney when the um, he was allowed to, and uh, opened the centre, the new centre in Adelaide. All he right. Was, All right. He yes, he's extraordinary. There's no doubt about it. Uh, I I was just speaking with Swami Chandra Shekharananda today. Uh, who was in Australia several years ago. Now he's the head of our center in Portland. And we were actually talking about Swami Sridharanji. And it's wonderful that you mentioned him in the evening class today. He is 95 years old. He is the head of our uh, um, uh, Vedanta Society in Australia, in Sydney, which already has so many branches, like Gloria says, in Adelaide, in Melbourne, in Brisbane. When he went there to Australia, in Sydney, there was nothing. There was no center. It, it had not started yet. He just went in a small rented apartment at the age of 80. <laughs> and from that time till now, it is the fastest expanding Vedanta society among our, our centers in the world. Extraordinary. So imagine starting a career at 80. <laughs> so, uh, so he is extraordinary full of grace, full of sweetness. He combines uh, jnana. He has studied under one of the most redoubtable scholars, uh, traditional pandits in Lucknow, uh, Ananda Jha. He bought the pandit and kept him in the ashram with great uh, respect and took care of him. And in return, the pandit taught him. So he has learned, uh, he is fully established, um, rigorously trained in the traditional shastras. Not only Vedanta, Nyaya and other things also. Deeply devotional. He has a very deep personal devotion to the Holy Mother. He was personally trained by um, our um, uh, Swami Virajanandaji, who was the president of the order. He was a uh, sevaka of Swami Virajanandaji. Extraordinary Karma Yogi. which just shows how he built this huge hospital in Lucknow. And now he has spread this, uh, these Vedanta societies across Australia at this advanced stage. Um, and a deep meditator. So all the yogas, there's a few extraordinary <laughs> spiritual seekers like this who, in whom all of these manifest. Now let me do number 30, verse number 30. Apare niyata hara pranan praneshu juhati sarve pyete yagya vido yagya kshapita kalmasha. Others again who regulate their food offer as a sacrifice the functions of the senses in the senses. All these indeed are knowers of the sacrifices, purified of their sins through sacrifices. So the twelfth and the last one in the list of twelve different practices which are described by Krishna as Yajna. Remember, original meaning of Yajna was ritualistic Vedic worship, fire worship. Now he is transformed. One of them he has included. The Vedic fire worship is also one of the twelve. But now he has reimagined all these, all these different practices, including the highest realization itself as Yajna. Now control of food. First of all, actual food which we eat. This is important actually. I know I don't give much importance to it, but it's actually, it's for a spiritual seeker, it is important. Um, a lot of energy is wasted in digesting food. If you do not eat well and eat healthily, what happens is, a lot of energy is wasted in that. A lot of our vitality, prana, goes into that. And the prana is continuously upset. If you keep on pouring things into the body, the prana gets activated again and again to digest that food. And that upsets the pranas. So there's a very, uh, I mean, Ayurveda experts and the Hatha Yogis know these details. I don't know the details. The five pranas, and there are five minor pranas also. They're all together ten actually. So they have specific activities. And the Ayurveda uh, uh, practitioners, they know this. And how it becomes upset. If we eat wrong, eat too much, eat at wrong hours, all of these things. Um, so fixed, eating should be fixed. How much and when? Nothing in between. Nothing in between. So there are so many funny stories about a person who wanted to lose weight, went to the doctor and the doctor said, all right, you need to go on a diet. 
two chapatis, two pieces of bread. He came back after a month and he had put on even more weight. What happened? I followed your advice. Two chapatis. He ate for breakfast and two chapatis after that and two chapatis for lunch and two chapatis after lunch and two chapatis for tea and two chapatis in the evening and two chapatis, two pieces of bread and dinner and post-dinner two more. <laughs> so two chapatis only. So this, I mean, no, not like that. Uh, in America, there's this snacking. Snacking is little bits of uh, chocolate, cookies. Here and there, you just, it's just they're very delicious. You put in the mouth. But that disturbs the prana. So this disturbed prana has to be calmed down and systematic, systematized so that it becomes healthy. That is called pranan praneshu juhvati. Offering the prana in the prana, it actually means um, revitalizing and balancing the pranas. The Ayurveda's experts, uh, practitioners are experts in this area. How do you do that? Niyata ahara, controlling the food. Controlling food means how much do I eat, when do I eat, how many meals and what do I eat. How do I eat? Attentively, restless. So, all of these. In America, I hear this. Stress eating. I'm stress eating. So, under thought of tension. The reaction to tension is eating. <laughs> but it harms the prana. This is one. This is most important. Central. And um, all the five senses are also regarded as, uh, the, as eating. Ahara. Shankaracharya says, Ahriyante, in a commentary on the Chandogya Upanishad, whatever is gathered from all sides, all sides means through eyes, ears, smell, taste, touch. That also one has to be careful about. What It's like, what are we pouring into the mind? Food is what we are pouring into the tummy. And the five senses are bringing in things which are pouring into the mind. If I put rubbish in, into my tummy, immediately tummy upset will be there. Similarly, if I put rubbish in the mind, mind is also very delicate, it gets upset. So not just physical food, but also sensory food, which I am dragging in from the world and putting into the mind. This is also a yajna, this is a good yajna. I have seen uh, monks who, um, who end up eating maybe once a day, uh, who eat very little Many different things I've seen. Uh, so they regulate their food. The idea in spiritual life ultimately is food is not the purpose of life. We do not uh, live to eat. We eat to live. So that is a cliche. Yes, I'm sorry it's a cliche. But the thing is if you go out here in New York, they call it a foodie's heaven. So endless. Now because of the COVID, they're, they're in trouble, many of the little restaurants. But... Endless varieties of food from all over the world. Why? Because we want taste. This kind of taste and that kind of... It becomes a lifelong obsession. A lifelong engagement. It's a huge multi-billion dollar industry. And what is the yogi's approach to food? Food is medicine. Hunger is an illness. It is cured by the medicine called food. Hunger and thirst, illness. Food and drink, medicine. What a drab... <laughs> unexciting, boring way of looking at food. Sarve piyate yajna veda. These are all experts in yajna. So yajna does not only mean ritualistic fire worship. Yajna means all these spiritual practices. Yajna kshapita kalmasha. By these practices, kshapita kalmasha means purified. Mind is purified. When mind is purified, the fitness for jnana, uh, jnana comes. Fitness for uh, realization comes. All right. We can. I just wanted to uh, remind all of us that tomorrow Swami Satyamayanji, who made himself so beloved to many of our devotees here in the Vedanta Society of New York, he has kindly agreed to give a uh, talk in our series of invited guest lectures. So that's set. I think you have received the link. So that's at 7 p.m. Eastern Time tomorrow. Eastern time, 7 p.m., 7 to 8. The topic is very interesting, like all his uh, subjects. Uh, hacking the code of life. So we'll see. We'll make us into spiritual hackers tomorrow. So I'll see you, see you there at 7 p.m. All right. Thank you so much. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat 
श्री राम कृष्णा रूपणमस्तु